Previously on Kangazang Remote Possibilities Earth deserter Jeff Spooner and his alien barber Ray have been sent out into the deserts of Profania Alpha to find a mythical object called the Universal Remote Control. They're both certain that it doesn't exist and that they're either going to starve out there or be eaten by the planet's indigenous life forms, one of which has just found them. Chapter 6 Remote Possibilities The sun of Profania Alpha finally saw fit to crawl up above the horizon. As Ray and Jeff, newly appointed artifact hunters, walked along the desert trail, Ray read up on their quest using the slate-like computer that the Queen had provided them with. It says here, began the sweating tonsorial trimmer, that for over a hundred generations the Slargs have been searching for the universal remote, literally a remote control for the universe. Jeff was listlessly booting his keepy uppy pebble along the trail, only half listening. Ray went on regardless. Apparently, whoever holds this thing has control of the universe's workings, literally. You know, my father once told me about this. He said it's the thing that empowered the most advanced races. To create, destroy, conquer, all the space and time. He added a little gasp of awe. Jeff took an almighty punt with his foot and the pebble threw off the trail. With nothing trivial to occupy him, he looked at Ray. Eh? What? So you're saying this thing is like a magic wand or something? Ray switched the slate off. Yes, either that or an atom bomb. It's true what they say. With great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, I know, interrupted Jeff. Ray was impressed. I'm surprised you knew that saying. It's from the Book of Bod, chapter 10, verse 10. Oh, I got it from Spider-Man, mumbled Jeff flatly. Book 1, chapter 4. Where are we supposed to find this thing anyway? We've been walking for hours. Like his tongue, his adventurous enthusiasm had totally dried up and tasted unpleasant. Well, we've followed the map so far. We should be entering Yob territory any time now. I suggest we be careful. These Yobs make the slugs look like children's television presenters by comparison. The two weary travellers reached a narrow pass between two towering mountains. Jeff stopped to crouch down at a small pool of water that had gathered in the shade of the rocks. He delved into it with cupped hands and drank. It was a bit warm and tasted a little coppery, but it refreshed him suitably. He hadn't slept all that well and was still tired. For a non-believer, Ray certainly seemed to be more enthusiastic about finding the lost artifact this morning. Not so much the fact that it would make them both famous, but more likely that it would just allow him to get home at last. This is the gateway to the village of the Yobs, proclaimed Ray. Jeff stood up and shuffled over to the gap in the mountains. In the dusty haze he could make out a wide flat plain dotted with crude conical wooden huts that resembled bonfires. Right in the centre of the village was a tall, thin tree that was at least a hundred feet in height. You said these Yobs are dangerous, he squinted, looking for signs of life among the huts. Ray stroked his goatee, trying to look deep and thoughtful. That, my friend, is an understatement. In fact, I go so far as to say you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy, he mused. Except for Swansea, he added. Well, firstly, how do we get in there to look for this non-existent thing? And secondly, how do we escape without being killed in the process? No idea, replied Ray, still trying, and failing completely, to maintain some dignity. Well, that's just brilliant. We're naff before we start then, exclaimed Jeff in a fit of newly generated despair. Ray turned to Jeff, looking annoyed. Don't you put the blame onto me. You're the one who thinks with Mr. Johnson and decided to go on this quest. You try and think of something. Jeff had to admit that it was mostly Mr. Johnson's fault, and the guilty expression he wore showed it. He stepped forward and looked out at the village once more, watching faint plumes of smoke waft upwards from the huts. I suppose we'll just have to improvise then. Make it up as we go. Otherwise, we'll never find a universe remote. As long as we're not discovered, we'll be... Just then, a scratching, scuffling noise came from out of the rocks. Jeff and Ray looked at each other in terror. They had been discovered. Overlord Kelvin sat in his throne room, bored rigid. To pass the time, he'd surveyed his lands, made some laws and raised taxes. Twice. That had been fun, but now he was feeling a bit jaded. He stood up and walked over to the door on the far side of the courtroom. Just as he reached the door handle, both the doors swung open, making him scream in shock. It wasn't conduct becoming of the new overlord of the Empire. Standing at the doorway was another trio of bureaucrats, only this time they didn't look afraid of Kelvin in the slightest. Because they weren't. This was no ordinary group of bean counters. They were galactic tax inspectors, ready to do a complete audit of the Scrag Empire and put to right any wrongs that they found in the process. That include deposing and replacing the Overlord if need be. They weren't to be messed with. Kelvin knew this. It wasn't the first time he had seen these imposing, sinister men. He'd heard tales of their previous visits to his father and knew that it was only these men that could make his dad look afraid. The tax inspector stepped into the room, and Kelvin scampered back to his throne as fast as he could, trying to regain his regal composure when he got there. One of the men spoke, a rasping, emotionless hiss. Overlord of Scrag, we come to perform a full inspection of your empire. We wish to know all that you have planned for the coming financial century. 
Kelvin thought as fast as his noodle would allow. Coughing a little to clear his dry throat, he began to stall the time. Ah, yes, well, in the coming months, I plan to, uh, expand. Yes, expand the empire by, uh, by conquering. Yes, conquering those worlds the nearest to us that need to be, well, conquered, I suppose. Is that it? asked the inspector. Yes. Well, no, said Kelvin, beginning to wobble. I, I plan to do more, of course. Like, um... He was beginning to crack up under the pressure of the unblinking, beady eyes focused on him. He had to think big. Bigger. Biggest, if entirely possible. Like conquering the entire universe, he declared loudly, standing up in his most noble pose, looking out into the middle distance. It had the desired effect. Kelvin heard a faint gasp of astonishment emanate from one of the inspectors. Um, if that's all right with you chaps? asked the overlord, sitting down again. The lead inspector looked suitably impressed. Excellent. And how do you intend to achieve this? He watched as Kelvin's previously confident expression gave way to befuddlement. Suddenly, Kelvin remembered his father's last request. I will, uh, conquer the universe because I will use the legendary universal remote. Yes, that's it. That's the thing. The chief inspector raised a tenth of one of his eyebrows, which signalled interest. Kelvin bluffed on regardless. And I plan to rule the universe with an iron fist, mightier than that of my father. He may have been a great ruler, but I promise you this, the universe will cower in terror at the very thought of my mighty fisting. The inspectors looked at each other speechlessly, then filed out the door. Kelvin ran over to his throne. Pushing the communicator button, he leaned into the microphone. Get me the royal advisers, pronto! Jeff and Ray stood backed against a stony wall, gasping at the sight that greeted them. It wasn't that they were in any mortal danger, and it wasn't that they had been surprised as such. It was the fact that they found themselves talking to one of the planet's indigenous species, a hopper. Now, two things went through Jeff's mind at boggling speed. Firstly, that this articulate, intelligent, and very alien alien was something he'd seen before. His childhood space hopper. Secondly, he felt guilt at realising he'd eaten the animal's ancestors recently, the orange meat served up with every meal. Yes, here he was, light years across the galactic disk, and he was talking to a living, breathing, surprisingly nutritious, bouncy toy. He rubbed his eyes. The hopper noticed. He's friend all right? It asked Ray. Ray was thankfully more composed. I think so. It's probably a little cosmic culture shock. Did you know that on his planet they have toys that look just like yourselves? I hear it. Not planet, but toy. The hopper looked sullen as it bounced a little closer. Many years I hunted for meat, skin taken for fun of slags and yobs. Skin sent to many places because of this. It pointed at Jeff with its antennae. Friend had one as child? Jeff spoke out. Well, I had one, but it wasn't made out of your skin. It was rubber, all over. It didn't have any of that fur on it or real eyes or anything. Oh, uh, cheap one. That okay? So he not bad human? Ray shook his head. No, not at all. He, uh, good human. The hopper cheered up considerably at this and changed the subject. Bobbing up and down in a similar way to a dog wagging its tail, it continued. You here to find Universal Remote? I hear you talking. Yeah, that's right, but it's impossible. Either it's down in the village over there, said Ray, pointing to the smoking huts, or it doesn't even exist. Either way, we're both dead meat. Jeff thought of the term dead meat and looked at the bobbing orange creature with renewed pangs of guilt. He nodded in agreement. Impossible. Impossible, snorted the hopper. Pah! Not impossible. Not non-existent. We know where it is. It was pleased that it had impressed the humans and skipped back a few feet. You come out now, they good humans, it called, seemingly in the direction of the rocks. From behind the rocky outcrops and large boulders, twenty more hoppers bounced tentatively out. Some were older, looking more leathery and beginning to grey around the whiskers, and some were a little more than football-sized babies bobbing energetically at the excitement of meeting two other beings that didn't want to skin and eat them. Jeff looked around at the orange crowd of bouncing admirers. It was like one of his more surreal dreams. But at least they had information, allies, and some sense of purpose now. Town meeting tonight, called the hopper. It beckoned to Jeff and Ray with its curly antennae. You come with us. Hop on. Ray, then Jeff, approached a hopper each rather sheepishly and straddled the orange blobs. Jeff mumbled a rather feeble apology as he got on and gripped the antennae. Then the entire herd of hoppers, led by the two humans, moved off. Jeff wobbled as he bounced, remembering his childhood days of boinging around the garden, and it soon came back to him. Minutes later, the plane echoed to the sound of ecstatic whoops and laughter as he felt the wind in his hair and bounced higher and further than he'd ever done as a child. The convoy of hoppers finally bounded into their town just over an hour later. It was more of an open-air commune, 
basic beds of grass and leaves, a washing pool, and the entire settlement was circled by a small collection of boulders for protection. Having no hands, just dexterous antennae, the hoppers weren't equipped to build anything particularly useful or complex, but there was a satisfying sense of a close-knit community. It seems strange to Jeff that reasonably intelligent, speaking creatures like the hoppers should live so primitively, but then again, strangeness and astonishment was fast becoming a regular thing in his life. After dismounting, Jeff went over to Ray, who was discussing the forthcoming meeting with the head of the tribe. What's the plan, then? Do we just pick up this remote thingy and go, or what? he asked, crossing two fingers surreptitiously in the hope of a simple answer. Ray turned around to face Jeff, and the hopper bobbed away. Not exactly, Jeff. You remember the Yob village that we saw? Yes, said Jeff cautiously. He found himself uncrossing his fingers, as it was obviously not working. Ray continued to explain. Well, there was that really tall tree in the middle of the village, remember? The universal remote is hidden at the top of the tree. In fact, it's not exactly hidden. You could probably reach it if you had a really, really long stick or something. Jeff shook the marbles in his cranium around for a second. Hang on a minute, he began, pointing for added emphasis on the point he was about to make. To be honest, it was a rather well-observed point, which was proof that Jeff was beginning to find his metaphorical feet in this new life of his. Hang on a minute, he repeated. If the remote is only at the top of the tree, why don't the yobs just climb up and get it, or saw the tree down? Unfortunately for Jeff, though his logic was sound, there was a rather noticeable absence of logic in the answer. I don't know how to climb, and I like the tree too much to cut it down. Jeff rearranged his mental marbles again to help clarify the answer. Don't know how to climb, he said in astonishment. Ray took Jeff by the shoulder and walked around the hopper village as he tried to explain. It became apparent that the yobs were of extremely limited abilities, mental, logical and physical. Their opposable thumbs had regressed the sub-primate standards generations ago, hence the inability to climb, and their unimpressive brains had long since withered away to something resembling a ladle full of mushy peas except that mushy peas, when tested under strict laboratory conditions, could at least recognise the fact that they were mushy peas and consequently not get ideas above their station. In fact, the mental capacity of even the highest ranking yob was so underdeveloped that he thought a myth was a female moth. The only thing the yobs worshipped more than alcohol and violence was their incredibly tall tree, which to them was a kind of totem pole. It was also the only thing they had in their settlement that hadn't been vandalised. Head-butted, chewed, danced with, urinated upon, worshipped, vomited over, even amorously molested, but not vandalised. Ray and Jeff had strolled away from the middle of the village. In front of them was a large crater, almost a hundred metres in diameter. On the floor of the crater were pear-shaped rocks of different sizes, arranged in straight lines. It looked like a giant solitaire board. Around each of the stones were small yellow flowers that grew wild on the plains. Neither Jeff nor Ray had seen anything like it, and it dawned on them that what they were looking at was a cemetery. Over to the left, Jeff noticed a little female hopper bounce into the crater with some more yellowy flowers held firmly in her antennae. She slowly and carefully bobbed around the stones until she came to a stone that was bigger than her. Leaning forward in a sort of bow, she placed the flowers at the base of the stone. Jeff saw a glint of light in the eye of the little creature that revealed a teardrop. The little hopper bobbed up again, then turned around and solemnly moved away, heading for the edge of the crater. She hopped up over the ridge and sat there looking at the stones, just like Jeff and Ray. Against his better judgment, Jeff walked over to the little hopper and crouched down. Ray remained standing at a respectful distance. Hello there, said Jeff. What's your name then? The hopper looked up at Jeff. Me Pon Pon. Me go see Mother. She have stone there. Jeff was touched. Although the thought of having a tender conversation with a space hopper was about as cubist as it could get, he did feel for the little orange child. Are all these stones to remember someone? he asked gently. Pon Pon nodded. All hoppers remembered here. Yobs come, slugs come. Each time, take many, kill all. Hoppers live on in head, not forgotten. Jeff put a friendly hand on the little hopper's head. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what I can do to help, but I'll do whatever I can, all right? Pon Pon smiled weakly. You good human, but more hoppers die, always die. Jeff swallowed in determination. Not if I can help it, little un. Pon Pon smiled up at the strange human, then she skipped off, heading for the village. Ray came over to Jeff, and they watched the little orange thing bounce away. "'What was all that about?' asked Ray. Jeff looked more solemn and serious than Ray had ever seen him. "'These yobs, and the slugs, they've been killing hundreds of hoppers every year. We've got to do something about it.' Ray tried to explain. "'Well, it doesn't seem right, I know, but in all honesty, they're kind of dumb animals, like cows, for instance, or chickens. They're beasts of burden, a source of food. What can we do?' "'These are intelligent, caring things.' That makes them a little more than dumb animals. We've got to stop this somehow, said Jeff with new resolve. Come on, said Ray. 
Let's get back to the village. We'll see what the situation is and how best we can help. The sun was beginning to set, sending golden beams of warm light through the clouds that cast soothing deep brown shadows across the desert plains. Jeff and Ray could smell the welcome aroma of cooking food and campfire smoke, and they headed to the town centre in the direction of the sights, sounds and smells. The village was a friendly place to be when the sun went down. Jeff and Ray sat on clumps of dry grass and watched as the villagers prepared a humble but varied banquet. The males hopped in, laden with fish that they'd caught in nearby rock pools, and the females cooked them over small fires. Jeff had wondered how these oddly shaped creatures cope without proper limbs, but he noticed that their head antennae were incredibly prehensile, and to add to that, they had tongues that were split twice, forming three crude digits that could grasp objects, or form into scoops for eating their favourite soup. Barbecued fish was followed by a thick vegetable soup, and small antennae made bread rolls. Jeff was all the more impressed by these little orange aliens after seeing how talented they were, and he strengthened his resolve there and then, vowing silently to do his best to free them from persecution. The hoppers had all gathered in what seemed to be the town square, in actuality a roundish, relatively empty patch of ground. Ray was offered a place at the front of the crowd of orange-bobbing villagers, and was soon supping from his second bowl of vegetable soup. He beckoned Jeff over to join him, as Chief Fnaf Nut, the oldest and wisest of the hoppers, bounced up onto a small mound of earth to address the gathering. I wonder if the Queen is missing us, said Jeff. Ray took a final slurp of soup and wiped the stray drips from his beard. I doubt it, Jeff, he replied matter-of-factly. I'll even go so far as to say she thinks we're both dead already, which is fine with me, because I really don't want to go back there, but there is a slight problem. Isn't there always, muttered Jeff sadly. The Penguin, said Ray. We've got to get back to her to get off this place, and that means taking the Universal Remote back to the Queen first. But that's still no guarantee of her letting us go. I appreciate that you want to help, Jeff, but let's face it, it's hopeless, Jeff. Hopeless! He dropped his head forward in a shameful display of melancholia. Cheer up, Ray, urged Jeff. At least the hoppers are going to help us get the remote. That's a start, isn't it? He nudged Ray with his elbow and nodded towards the chief, who was about to begin. Jeff was surprised to hear that Chief Fnafnut had what sounded like a brummy accent. Dear hoppers, many time I speak of old tale. Legends say thing that make big changes get stole by lobs. Legends say too of two legs that come to hoppers and help. Here humans in now time come for big fight. Yobs many and strong. Hoppers few but quick. Hoppers win big fight. Get remote back. Hearing this, the excited hoppers began to chatter loudly, bobbing up and down quickly. At the front of the audience, Jeff and Ray looked at each other, clearly not as excited. The word fight was terrifying enough to both of them, but when proceeded with the adjective big, it became seriously worrying. Jeff had only won one fight in his life, and that was with Reverend Wilson. And if truth be told, that only counted as victory because Wilson hadn't fought back. So, all right, it wasn't even a fight then. Ray was having similar thoughts. He too had only been victorious in a combative situation once, and that was an hour-long, sweat-stained ordeal of mentally and physically exhausting battle against a medium-sized blue bottle that had invaded his shop a week ago. Had Ray not been armed with a newspaper, a can of bug zap, and a water pistol, the outcome might have been very different indeed. The hopper chief waved his antennae in a gesture that effectively quietened the enthusiastic throng. When remote back, humans fulfil legend. Take to old young old ones far away. Things had got to a point in Jeff's head where the questions outnumbered the answers again. He stood up, drawing gasps of what sounded like shock, but was actually reverence from the assembled townsfolk. What legend? What old young old ones? What in the name of Bobby McFerrin are they talking about? Clearly he was fighting for adequate phraseology. Don't Woody, said Fnafnut. Be happy. Jeff groaned. Big fight tomorrow, continued the orange blob. Yob's no match for hoppers and humans. Get remote, all well again. And the old young old ones? Asked Ray, who was feeling a little left out. Who are they? The chief seemed surprised that Ray, being one of the saviours of the hoppers, hadn't heard of them, but he thought it best to explain anyway. Old young old ones come from big far away. They make remote, but remote stolen end up here. But now I must go back. Methuselah, place to take it. Old young old ones make safe then. Something flicked a light bulb on in Ray's darkened mind. He spun around, grabbing Jeff by the shoulders. Methuselah, I remember now. Jeff, I've heard of the Methuselans, a race of immortals. They're known as the wisest of all the life forms in the universe. Jeff looked weary. And on the other end of the stick are us, Ray, the stupidest life forms in the universe. What chance have we got? Tell me that then. Ray's newfound enthusiasm briefly got lost again. He frowned as the truth sank down over them both like a duvet. Well, I'm not sure. It could be a long and terrible conflict. But let's see what we could do, eh? Like I always say, 
Improvise until something miraculous happens. You mean miraculous, corrected Jeff. Shaking his head, Ray explained. Nope. Miraculous is pertaining to miracles. Miraculous is a fine blend of a miracle and calculus. We'll overcome this problem, my friend, and we'll be back in a penguin heading to Kangazang before tea time tomorrow. Just you wait and see. Jeff had to admit that Ray's optimism was infectious, and it made him feel a lot better. The hoppers showed both of the legendary bipeds to a small cave, which was padded on the floor with soft straw, and they soon crashed out, trying to clear their minds of the impending battle the next morning. A huge circular table in a huge circular room displayed a disappointingly small square map to Lord Kelvin of Scrag. He had brought his royal advisers in to locate the whereabouts of the Universal Remote, and in just two days of sleepless researching, it had to be said that they'd done well for their new ruler. The great book repositories and libraries of the entire planet were scrutinized and examined meticulously for any clues leading to the fabled item, and with a little searching on the info hex net, they had narrowed it down to one of two locations, both of which were on the surface of Profania Alpha. Kelvin stood up from his chair, causing a Mexican wave of flinching to ripple around the advisers seated at the immense table. When the shuddering had died down, he proceeded to walk around the table as he'd seen his father do, stroking his rather pointy chin. He had no impressive beard as yet. He did a rather impressive job of looking knowledgeable as he strode elegantly around the room, but underneath the thin show of bravado was a lost cause. He had no idea how to read a map whatsoever. But that, he theorised, was what the royal advisers were for. Tell me, he began, what's the name of this planet again? The bravest and highest rank of the advisers cleared his throat. My lord, this is Profania Alpha, seventy light years from the Scrag Empire, situated two thirds of the way across the galactic disk en route to the Bellatrix system. The advisor decided to stop there as he could see Kelvin's eyes glazing over. Ah, good, good. Do we own this planet? he said. The advisor shook his head. No, my lord. It is self-governed by the dominant species headed by Queen Shelley of the Slargs. Oh, is that going to be a problem, do you think? said Kelvin, chewing on a fingernail. Not really, my lord. Although the Slargs have a formidable military presence, it is fortunate for us that the Universal Remote is not located there with the Slargs. We have searched the archives for all the available facts and have reason to believe it lies with the secondary species known as the Yobs. Um... That might pose a slight, uh, problem at. Kelvin was experiencing three simultaneous emotions by now, boredom, confusion, and worry. He felt that the time had come for actions because words had clearly become too tiresome for him. Mobilise the troops! Prepare the planet destroyers! He declared. Another advisor cleared his throat. Um, we don't actually have planet destroyers, my lord. Really? What about galactic blitzers? No. Oh. Um, what's the name of that really big ship then, the red one? It's got that nice tower on top and the big guns at the front. That's the Scraggy Imperial Battle Cruiser, my lord, your father's ship. Ooh, that one then. Load it up and let's get going. Kelvin clasped his hands together in satisfaction and grinned maniacally. The advisers rose from the table and began to make for the exit. Wait, called their overlord and master. There's something I haven't done yet. The advisers looked around at each other. They'd surely dotted all the I's and crossed every T. The researching and planning was perfect. Kelvin pointed at the shortest of the advisers with a thin index finger. You, he called. You displease me. The short advisor jumped and began stuttering in fear. What, what, what have I done to upset you, your, your worshipfulness? I, I, I've served you faithfully for, for years, uh, uh, days. Kelvin realised that the short man had a point. His eyes roved around the room. Finally they stopped on a half-drank cup of tea that the advisor had left to go cold. Vindictively... Kelvin pointed to the cup. You offend me with your blatant refusal to finish the royal tea. As the unfortunate advisor continued to shake and protest, Kelvin made his way over to the throne. He jabbed the button on the arm of the chair, and the all-too-familiar flash and bang reduced the advisor to a small pile of dust. Let that be a lesson to you, yelled Kelvin to his assembled nervous audience. Now, let's go to war. Morning came on Profania Alpha. The sun was just creeping up over the horizon, and the village of the Yobs was slowly coming to life. One particularly foul brute lay crashed out at the foot of their tall tree, surrounded by the sticky orange remains of a hopper kebab. The Yob looked like the result of a gene-splicing experiment involving a gorilla, a wrestler, and a rhinoceros, only hairier. His large body was topped by a thick neck, and on top of that was a small head with a sloping forehead that indicated the absence of a particularly large brain. Fleas bounced gaily over his hide, and flies circled the unconscious lump, no doubt basking in the stomach-emptying stench that pervaded his very skin. 
Drooling from the side of his mouth, the thuggish moron twitched. Something had begun to rouse him from his alcohol-induced stupor. He grunted and broke wind loudly. This provoked one eye to open, but opening the other proved to be too much of an effort, so he settled back to sleep. Then, a distant rumbling woke the yob once more. Dragging himself into a sitting position, he looked down at his stomach. Must be hungry. He grunted and scratched his personal areas, sniffing his stubby fingers after each scratch. But the rumbling persisted. Not only did it persist, but it grew louder. The yob looked around to see other yobs emerging from their huts in equal puzzlement. One of the yobs grunted and ran to the edge of their settlement, pointing wildly at the horizon in the direction of the sound. His eyes widened and the ugly face froze as the information took time to crawl from his eyes to his minuscule and rarely used brain. Out of the sun came an incredible sight. A thousand hoppers poured forth an unstoppable orange mass, accompanied by a thundering drumbeat generated by their bouncing movements. Right at the front of the charge were Ray and Jeff wearing crude vests that had wooden plates attached for armour. They hung onto the antennas of the biggest hoppers and swung large wooden clubs over their heads. Jeff swore he could hear the classical strains of Ride of the Valkyries in his head, whilst Ray hummed Holding Out for a Hero as the soundtrack to the epic scene. The Yobs may have been stupid to the point of insanity, but they knew an attack when they saw one. Grunting and yelling frantically, they raced around, grabbing clubs and stones for use as weapons. Some had crude swords made from scrap metal. The Yobs formed a rough line facing the oncoming stampede. Jeff shouted over at Ray. OK, this is it. You take your lot around to the right, and I'll sort this lot out. The bouncing horde split into two groups, confusing the Yobs even more. Behind Jeff, the whooping and hollering group of hoppers swung double clubs around their heads from their antennae. The first wave of hoppers ploughed into the yob line like a tidal wave into a sandcastle. It was inconceivable to the yobs that the timid orange bouncy things could ever pose any sort of threat to them, but generations of mindless slaughter can do great things to motivate the meek. The yobs scattered as the hoppers attacked, swinging their clubs into the heads of their lifelong enemies. Blood, sweat and drool sprayed into the air with every impact. Every now and again one of the yobs would manage to hit a hopper, and it would scream out loudly as it deflated and died, leaking its marmalade-like blood. But this only served to enrage the Fallen One's comrades, and the attack grew in ferocity. Ray took his group around the side of the village, effortlessly dispatching any retreating yobs that ran from the onslaught. He fought a way to the tree at the centre of the settlement, and began to circle it, keeping any yobs at bay with a dizzying barrage of swinging clubbage. Meanwhile, at the front of the village, the yobs were putting up a good fight. They had broken up into smaller groups, and each group successfully coordinated their defences, picking off a few hoppers every few minutes. Jeff stopped his ride and leapt off, adrenaline surging through his veins as he ran screaming into the yob defences. One of the yobs spun his huge frame around to see the unnatural sight of Jeff, a human on the side of the hoppers. He swung his log-like arms around, catching Jeff on his shoulder and knocking him off his feet. Jeff went tumbling across the dusty floor. The wooden plate armour only made it more painful as it jabbed him all over. He looked up to see the dust clear, and the sun was eclipsed by the huge yob standing over him. It was all over. The giant scraggy battlecruiser, Furious Anger, came out of hyperspace into the Profania system. Looking like a barnacled red shark, it powered along using multiple nuclear fusion drive engines towards its goal. Hanging in front of them was a small blue planet of Howley Sheet. Overlord Kelvin stood at the top of his ship's observation tower, surveying the journey. In his right hand he held his father's scepter of office, a thin bejeweled cane that concealed a deadly electrified spike. In his left, he held an equally bejeweled paper sick bag, already half full. Light speed travel didn't agree with the poor boy. He looked at the bag, considering a top-up, but noticed his wrist chronograph that showed him the date. This reminded him of how urgent his quest was. A uniformed navigator stepped up. He looked nervous as he eyed the scepter. My lord, we've arrived at the Provania system. The planet we seek is ahead, just past Howley Sheet. There. He indicated the small blue one out of the window. Excellent. How long will it take us to arrive? said Kelvin. Well, once we plot a course around this planet, we should... Go through it, idiot! Let nothing stand in our way! Kelvin was getting power tipsy. The navigator gulped, expecting to be zapped at any moment. Th th through it, my lord, he stammered. Yes! Blow it away! Open fire! yelled Kelvin, pointing dramatically at the blue unsuspecting globe. At once, my lord! The soldier saluted and turned to leave. One more thing, added Kelvin quietly. Y yes my lord? said the soldier, preparing for a painful, spiky disintegration. Kelvin handed him the puke sack. Take this away, will you? There's a good chap. Outside, the people of the planet Howley Sheet had picked up the approaching intruder, and panic set in. But it was far too late. The furious anger lived up to its name, sending a salvo of trillion megawatt laser pulses into it. The last collective words from the people of Howley Sheet 
were the name of their planet. The battlecruiser moved on, gliding effortlessly through the maelstrom of debris and newly created asteroids. Jeff lay on the dusty ground, breathlessly looking up at the huge yob standing over him. The yob grunted in disgust and raised his club. It was all over. All over for the yob, as a small orange hopper flew through the air and hit the man mountain smack in the temple. The yob lost consciousness immediately and hit the dirt like a wardrobe full of bricks, and lay there motionless and silent, save for a small escape of bodily gases. Leave human alone, big stinky, said Ponpon in defiance. Jeff sat up and saw the little hopper balancing proudly on the fallen Goliath's chest. With renewed vigour, he swept up his little friend into his arm and rejoined the fight. Ray was standing beside the tall tree and had also dismounted. The remaining hoppers kept the last few yobs at bay while Ray looked for a way to get the remote from the highest bow. No amount of shaking or vibration would dislodge it. There had to be another way. He looked across the square and saw Jeff racing towards him, club in one hand and pon-pon under his arm. Over here, Jeff! He yelled over the cacophony of shouts, bounce, thumps and battle cries. Jeff looked up at the tree. It's massive, he shouted. We can't reach that. We'll have to cut it down somehow. Ray waved his hand, shaking his head. No, we can't risk it. If the remote gets damaged, it's useless. Besides, he added sheepishly, nobody thought to bring a saw. Jeff quickly looked up again at the top of the tree. Then he crouched, putting Pon Pon down on the ground. All right, little un, you've saved me. Now it's your turn to save us all. Round up the rest and bring him back here. The little hopper bounced off eagerly. Ray looked confusedly at his friend. What could she possibly do? he asked. Leave it to me. Let's get back to twatting these twats first. He ran over to the nearest yob who was engrossed in battling an older hopper and smacked him as hard as he could on the back of his ape-like noggin. The yob spun round half-dazed and Jeff followed it up with a penalty kick of astonishing force right between his legs. A pitiful high-pitched yelp from the yob told Jeff that he'd hit the jackpot. The thug crashed to the ground so fast that Jeff had to dive to one side to avoid being crushed by the massive frame. Ray was also getting into the fighting spirit. He'd found two clubs, each with leather straps on the end, and he quickly tied them together, forming an oversized pair of nunchaku. Ray moved off into the battling horde, swinging his new weapon of choice into any yob skull that he came across. It was a good ten minutes before the battle died down. The remaining yobs had decided that enough was enough, and began to gallop away as fast as their thick and stumpy legs could carry them. Jeff and Ray stood among a sea of bodies, mostly yobs. It pleased Jeff to see that there were few hopper fatalities. Most were unconscious, but occasionally the terrible sight of battered and lifeless bodies both Yob and Hopper greeted his eyes. At the tree, Ray called Jeff back. The hoppers had congregated around the base of the tree and Ray was trying to organise them into a sort of cone arrangement so that one of them could get to the top of the tree. That's it. Steady now, said Ray, trotting from side to side, trying to keep the formation in place with words of encouragement. But soon, the very nature of the hopper's anatomical construction meant that the structure was never going to be solid enough to support its own weight. The lower hoppers began to compress and squash, and the hoppers on top wobbled and tumbled down. Ray looked at the collapsed pile and tutted. This'll never do. Come on, let's try again, he called. No, forget that, chipped in Jeff. It'll never stay solid enough, and anyway, there aren't enough hoppers to get even halfway up there. Hmm, you might be right. What do you suggest? asked Ray in near total befuddlement. Watch. Jeff arranged the hoppers in a long line running from the base of the tree to as far back as they would go. Ray looked on, a blend of amusement and pride crossing his face as he watched this particularly normal human find a solution to an almost impossible problem. All righty then. Jeff beckoned over to the little hopper who previously saved his life. You ready, Pompon? he asked. The hopper nodded. Me ready. Fly like bird. Save all. Jeff led Pompon along the lined up villagers and as he passed each one, he instructed them to start bouncing up and down on the spot. Soon the entire line was like an undulating orange snake, again accompanied by the thundering beat. Jeff and the brave little hopper got to the end of the line. Pon Pon took a deep breath. OK, Jeff shouted above the noise. Once you've done your bit, get round to the other side as quick as you can. Ray took a few steps back. He still had no idea what this crazy plan was, but he imagined it might involve him getting pummeled to paste if he wasn't careful, and in all honesty, he was right. Ponpon leapt into a long bounce, landing on the end hopper. The timing was perfect. The two hoppers compressed at exactly the same moment, and the resultant bounce was double the height of the first one. She came down again, but further along the line, where another hopper caught her and sprung her up even higher. The hoppers at the end of the line, furthest away from the tree, quickly hopped around to the other side and watched intently as Ponpon continued to gain altitude every time she landed on another in the line. Jeff stuffed a knuckle in his mouth in tense concentration, mumbling, Come on, come on, you can do it. Ponpon was halfway along the line, and already she was bouncing over half the height of the tree. 
All the now redundant hoppers had gathered near Ray and watched. This was it. The final bounce. There would be no room for error. Suddenly, Jeff realized that the last hopper in line was the chief, the oldest one from the village. The momentum wouldn't be enough, and it might even kill the old chap. Jeff called over to a group of three of the biggest hoppers he could find and directed them over to the chief. Pon Pon was making her penultimate descent. With milliseconds to spare, the three larger hoppers bounded in, knocking Chief Fnaf Nut out of harm's way, and took his place, knotting themselves together by their antennae. Pon Pon came down fast, and with a loud smack she bounced up again higher than the tree itself. It was an astonishing sight. Travelling through the air, hundreds of feet above the ground, the little hopper gasped. No other hopper had done what she had, and she was rewarded with a breathtaking view of her land. From the twinkling golden castles of the Slargs far off near the horizon, to the hopper village just past the mountain range, it was awe-inspiring. The wind whistled past her, and even a bird flew by with a rather confused look on its beak. For just one brief moment, she was one with the gods. Looking across to her village, she saw the cemetery in its solitaire board arrangement. Pon Pon picked out the stone that served as a memorial to her mother, and smiled. For you, mother. She flew over the top of the tree at the apex of her leap, and she could see the universal remote sitting in a bow beneath her. Gritting her teeth, she curled up as best she could, and turned a somersault which allowed her antennae to grasp the metallic remote as they passed it. Down on the ground, the rest of the hoppers had arranged themselves into a crash landing pad. Jeff and Ray clung to each other as if their lives depended on it, both with tears in their unblinking eyes. Pon Pon came down like a meteorite, still clutching the lozenge-shaped remote control. But something went wrong. In this unique case, what comes down must go up, and she hit the group of villagers as planned, dropping the remote. But then she rebounded up again, flying way past the huddled group. Jeff and Ray gasped in terror as they watched Pon Pon crash into the ground hard and skitter off across the rocky surface, rolling and half-bouncing until her little body ground to a stop. Everyone raced over to the fallen hopper and gathered around, looking in with grave concern. Jeff pushed through to get to her. He knelt at the little one's side. There was no sign of life. Little Pon Pon had suffered terrible damage upon landing, and her body and face were marked with numerous cuts and grazes, each one leaking clear, orange blood. More awful was the fact that she was half deflated, which was never a good sign for a hopper. The crowd saw this, and a sigh of sympathy rang out. Some of the hoppers began to weep. This little orphan had become the greatest of all hoppers in her short life, and would no doubt be honoured as such. Jeff sniffed, wiping his eyes with the back of his hand. He gently cradled the little one in his arms and stood up. He looked around the scene and was surprised to realise that it was probably the saddest event he'd ever witnessed. The hoppers hung their antennae in sadness as he spoke. I'm responsible for this. It was too much to expect from a young child. I only hope that you can forgive me and, and honour the memory of Pon Pon here because she saved not only me and Ray, but your village and your way of life. Remember her forever. Get your biggest stone and place it with her family. Ray's bottom lip twitched uncontrollably. The hoppers looked down at the ground in an unspoken minute's silence. All that could be heard was the desert winds howling around the mountains. Then there was a gentle hiss. Jeff looked down at the child in his arms and saw that Pon Pon was reinflating. He looked on in astonishment as the little one's eyes flickered open. No stone for Pon Pon yet, gasped the child weakly. Me want to celebrate victory. Jeff whooped in joy as all the hoppers realised that their little hero was still alive. Ray threw his head back and wailed loudly, the emotional roller coaster becoming too much for him. The group moved off, heading back to their village. It was going to be a great celebration. About an hour or so later, a huge shadow moved over the devastated Yob village. Hundreds of feet up in the sky, the terrible shape of the furious anger moved in, like some evil vulture circling for scraps. Bugger! screamed Kelvin. We're late! Heads will roll for this! And roll they did. The following morning, after the joyous party, Jeff and Ray stood at the edge of the Hopper village, preparing to return with the Universal Remote to the Kingdom of the Slargs. The eldest Hopper handed Ray the remote, and Ray accepted it carefully, looking at the strange and revered object. It was a flattened, torpedo-shaped thing, pretty much resembling a remote control as one would expect, except that it was larger and had only a small number of golden buttons. It definitely looked of alien, at least otherworldly, construction. Jeff regarded the object. Well, now we have it, what does it do? he asked. The old hopper looked serious, or at least as serious as an orange bouncing pear-shaped thing with antennae could look. Remote fixes things, 
changes, alters. Very powerful and very dangerous. Only old, young, old ones to use it. Please deliver safe. Jeff nodded, not quite understanding the old chap. Ray put the remote into a small shoulder bag that he had been given. It looked like a lady's handbag, but he had no other options. Okay, then, said Ray, stretching his arms out in preparation for the trek back to the city. Time we went, I suppose. Thanks for everything, old chap. He patted the hopper on his head and began to walk. Jeff didn't. Come on, Jeff, said Ray, slightly confused. Not yet. Look, answered Jeff, pointing to a number of approaching hoppers. From the village huts, the rest of the villagers emerged. At the front of the group were the three big hoppers that helped in Pon Pon's giant leap, and they carried a crude hammock-cum-stretcher inside which sat their little hero. Pon Pon still looked a little weak and battered, but she was smiling and on the road to recovery. The hoppers reached the humans and raised the hammock up so that Pon Pon could address them. Thank you, humans, she began. Hoppers safe from yobs now. Never attack again. Jeff shook his head. No, you guys have saved us, and hopefully now you'll have a real future for once. He looked at the other villagers around him. You got Pon Pon to thank for this freedom. Never forget that. Pon Pon beamed at Jeff. They know. Me village chief. Uh, when me grow up. Jeff smiled. And a great choice too, little un. He kissed Pon Pon on the forehead and set her gently back down into the hammock. Come back soon. Don't forget hoppers, said Pon Pon. Jeff nodded. We will. See you soon, all of you, he replied. In the back of his mind was one unsolved problem. The slogs had also been guilty of persecuting and slaughtering the hoppers. How were they going to be safe from them? The hoppers watched as Jeff walked off. He turned and waved, then caught up with Ray. A few steps later, they were both cheered up to hear a rhythmic rumbling of the hoppers bouncing up and down on the spot, as if applauding their new friends. End of chapter 6 Thank <laughs> you.